Our scripture reading this morning is found in the book of Matthew, the 27th chapter, beginning in verse 62 and moving into chapter 28 through verse 10. If you're using one of the Pew Bibles, it's on page 993. 993 if you're using one of the Bibles in the Pew. Matthew's incredible accounts of the resurrection of Christ. Follow along as I read, beginning in verse 62 of Matthew chapter 27. Now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I am to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go, make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to, the, came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. Just as he said, Come see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee. And there they will see me. God, there is no greater, greater words than he is not there. He has risen. The tremendous hope that that gives us, the tremendous confidence that that gives us, that he overcame death, that death could not hold him in a tomb. God, we praise you this day that we serve a risen Lord, that we come today to worship a risen Lord. His body cannot be found in a grave in Jerusalem because he is not there. He rose from the dead. And Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to have access into your presence, to know you, to be made right with you because of all that Christ did and accomplished on our behalf. Father, we praise you this day that we can come and worship Every Sunday is a reminder to us that you are a risen Lord, but especially on this time of year when we come, God, to remember that event, to focus on that event, and to realize that it's an event of historical significance as well as eternal significance. And we praise you and thank you for what you have done in Christ. And we thank you, Father, that as we come to worship today, Lord, that you are going to, through the fellowship of the believers and through the, the teaching of your word and the, just the edification of the songs we sing and the words we hear, that we are built up in our faith and confidence in all that you have done. God, we pray that you would be with our nation, our nation that is lost its way, that has turned from truth, that has turned away from you, has sought to go its own way. We pray for repentance. We pray, God, that you will bring many to Christ. We pray that your Holy Spirit would work in the hopelessness and the uh, purposelessness of life that so many feel and experience, that they would find hope in Jesus Christ, a risen Lord. We just thank you for this time. We commit our time of worship to you now in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, this morning we are in the book of Matthew, as you will note from our reading earlier. Um, I would also ask you to turn to Mark 16. Just have that in your hand there so you can hold uh, both of these passages together because I will flip back and forth and to save us time and having to look that up, it'll, if you already got your hand in one place, you can flip back really quickly because the account of the resurrection is found in all four Gospels and um, Pretty much at the end of each of those Gospels is where you find that particular writer's um, uh, presentation of this important, very important event. A, for, a few years ago, uh, several years ago now, my uh, wife and I, Ann and I, were. Uh, ma- it was made possible for us by uh, some very generous people to send us to Israel uh, to take a tour of the middle of Israel and Egypt and places like that. Uh, we stayed in a hotel in Jerusalem, right outside Jerusalem, on the Mount of Olives. Uh, and the hotel looked down into the Kidron Valley, up to the eastern gate of the old city of Jerusalem. It was a pretty uh, common hotel for tourists to stay in. But there is a cemetery along the side of that mountain, along the side of the Mount of Olives there. It's one of the oldest cemeteries in the world. It's a very important cemetery um, to the Jewish people. In fact, some um, very important uh, Jewish figures throughout history have been buried there. Uh, Zechariah, the book of Zechariah in the Old Testament, he's believed to be buried in that cemetery. Uh, That rebellious son of David, Absalom, is buried in that cemetery. Uh, More recent uh, prime minister, uh, Begin, is uh, buried in that cemetery. Uh, uh, Jews want to be buried in that cemetery, is my point. A lot of... Um, not a lot of room left. Uh, it's got over 150,000 graves in that area, uh, so it's not exactly uh, a lot of space. But uh, they want to be buried there. The reason they want to be buried there is because they believe that when Jesus comes, the Messiah comes to establish his kingdom, the dead will raise. I mean, they believe this. They believe when Messiah comes, the dead will rise. And If you're buried there, you'll be one of the first to rise, is their thinking and their belief. Where exactly did they get this idea of a resurrection? They don't hold to the New Testament. So these passages I read this morning are not in the Old Testament. They're in the New Testament. They don't look at the New Testament. But let me just show you some places in the Old Testament that feed this understanding by Jews regarding resurrection, because the Bible does say some things in the Old Testament about it. For example, in Job chapter 19, you can mark these down and just go back and look at them, but in Job 19, the oldest, probably the oldest book in the Old Testament, Job says this in verse 25, as for me, my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth. The last day, he will take his stand on the earth. Verse 26, even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. Now that's somewhat veiled, yes, but pretty clear. My skin is going to die and rot in a grave, but yet I will have a body with which to see God. In Hebrews 11, chapter 19, I realize that's the New Testament, but the writer of Hebrews is referring back to an Old Testament event. It's the event of when Abraham is told by God to sacrifice his son, Isaac. Remember, Isaac was the son of promise, the long-awaited son through whom you will be the father of a great nation, promise. And now God is telling Abraham to put the knife in him. And the writer of Hebrews tells us what's behind the faith of Abraham in verse 19 of chapter 11 of Hebrews. He considered, Abraham considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead. He knew that there would be a future blessing in his son. And if God tells me to kill my son, God has a way of still using my son raising him from the dead. 
In Psalm 49, 15, listen to this. But God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol, the place of death, the grave. He'll redeem my soul from the grave, for he will receive me from the grave. Listen to Isaiah chapter 26. Your dead will live. Their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy, for your dew is as the dew of the dawn, and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. And then in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, and others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Veiled, yes, but there, present in the Old Testament. Even in Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, you know that one, the suffering servant, the, 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 the passage that speaks of the suffering of the Messiah. When you come down to verse 10, it says this, of Isaiah 53. The Lord was pleased to crush him. They were told in that 53rd chapter of Isaiah that God would crush their Messiah, putting him to grief if he would render himself as a guilt offering. That's exactly what Christ did on the cross, became a guilt offering. My guilt and your guilt was put on Christ. But listen to this. In that same verse, verse 10, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. You see, right there in that verse, in that very passage, you have the death and you have the resurrection of the Messiah. Those are Old Testament references. Yeah, somewhat veiled in some ways. Maybe not as clear as what we see in the New Testament, but you at least understand why. Everybody wants to be buried in that cemetery if you're a Jew, <laughs> on the side of the Mount of Olives, <laughs> because resurrection is connected to their Messiah. Now, what they don't have and what they wish they had, I'm sure, is what we have in Matthew chapter 27 and 28, the resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah. Um, Matthew reveals facts about the resurrection. Matthew gives you and me some reasons in this passage, gives us some reasons why we can be sure of the resurrection, why we can be sure that it's not a hoax, because folks, it has been attacked, it has been attacked for 2,000 years. And you can understand why, because if you can discredit the resurrection of Christ, you can discredit the gospel. You can discredit Christianity totally, because the, the resurrection of Christ is central. Central. Just listen to these words of the Apostle Paul before I dive into that text. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, listen to this. This is, this is something we all need to think about. Verse 13 says this, if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain. It's in, it, it's in vain for you to show up today to listen to somebody preach from the Bible if Christ is not raised from the dead. Your faith is also in vain. You're believing a lie if Christ is not raised. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God. We are liars. We're liars. Everybody that's ever proclaimed the gospel is a liar if Christ did not rise from the dead. Verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you are, guess what, still in your sins. There is no forgiveness for your sin. There is no hope for you. You are dead you are still in your sins, and you will die in your sins. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, I can't preach any hope at any funeral. You know that? There's no hope. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. 
if, if our hope is in Christ is just for here and now, and we're just saying this is not a nice thing to believe while we spend our 70 or so years here on earth, then that's pitiful. That's what Paul says as he states the importance of the resurrection of Christ. So these verses in Matthew that I want to show you today show us that we have a faith that's built on uh, rock-solid uh, facts. I, I want to just show you some facts in this passage because Peter says, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you about or to give an account for the hope that is in you. I just want you to see some facts, just some facts this morning regarding the resurrection, reasons that we can believe the resurrection. The first one, verses 62 through 64. Um, the tomb was guarded and the tomb was sealed. That's what we see in verses 62 through 66, actually. But let me just read 62 through 64. On the next day, uh, the, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I am to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Notice the day is following the day of preparation. Preparation. The day of preparation was the day before the Sabbath. Excuse, okay, you understand that? The day of preparation means on the day, the, they prepared for the Sabbath day on Friday. Jesus died on Friday. So these events that we're reading about in verse 62 are happening on Saturday. And we see that Jesus had a public crucifixion on Friday. People witnessed a death. They witnessed a spear plunged into his side. His death was public. Romans were good at deaths. They knew how to make sure people were dead. And say so on Friday, he was dead. And the next day, which is the Sabbath day, these Religious leaders, the Pharisees and chief priests, come to Pilate. Why did they do this? Keep in mind, Pharisees are very legalistic people. You don't do anything on the Sabbath. You don't do anything. Uh, that's why you have a day of preparation, so you don't have to do anything on the Sabbath. Uh, here it is, not just any old Sabbath. This is a high holy Sabbath. This is the Sabbath in the time of Passover. And these Pharisees are going to Pilate requesting with this unusual request that they want him to do something about securing the tomb. I believe they probably, being a legalist, when you're a legalist, you know you make your own rules. And that's what they've done here because... They are violating their rules of defilement also, being in the presence of a Gentile, a Gentile governor. Um, I think when you're legalistic, you, you tend to do things when people can't see you doing them. You set your own rules, and, and you want to be spiritual. Now, you want to look spiritual, but you don't want to be spiritual. That's a legalist, Okay. Uh, you want to you wanna look good on the outside, but you don't want to be good on the inside. Uh, Jesus rebuked them for this in many places, saying, you're whitewashed tombs, you look so good outwardly, but inwardly you're dead men's bones. Um, remember, they like to pray in public, they like to give in public, they like to fast in public to be seen by men. And here I think, well, why are they doing this? Well, they're doing this because nobody sees them. You follow me? Everybody else is focused on the Sabbath. These guys are focused on something else. The second reason they go to Pilate, I think, what was behind their thinking is just the intensity of this situation. Um, if those disciples steal that body, and if those disciples take that body 
away and then go out in the streets and start telling everybody he rose from the grave, then people are going to really start to look to Jesus in a worse way than they did before. In fact, they're going to just think he's the Messiah. They're going to think he's the king of the Jews. And so that's very, very threatening to them. Um, So those are things that sort of stand out in what they are doing here. I think it's interesting observation to make is that these Pharisees knew that Jesus had talked about rising from the dead. His own disciples didn't even remember that. His own disciples didn't remember that. They, they just it went over their heads that he was going to rise from it. They're not expecting a resurrection. These guys, they remember. Look in, well, you don't have to turn there. This is in Mark 9. In Mark 9, he told his disciples about the resurrection in these words. The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement. That's what he said to his disciples. In Matthew 12, he says to the Pharisees these words, because the Pharisees said to him, show us a sign. And Jesus says to them, you are an evil and adulterous generation. You crave for a sign. No sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah the prophet. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monsters, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. They remember that. These Pharisees and chief priests in Matthew 27, they remember Jesus said that. And they want to make sure that that doesn't happen. It's not that they believed Jesus would rise from the dead. It's they just didn't want the disciples to steal the body to make it look like he did. Back in Matthew 27, verse 65 and 66, here is how Pilate responds to this request. You have a guard. So he gives them a guard, a Roman guard, Roman security guard, more than one, several of them. Make it as secure as you know how, verse 66. And they went and made the grave secure along with the guard. They set a seal on the stone. So they got the guards and they got a seal. A seal would be a thread, a long rope type thread with two Roman seals on both ends of it. And this is pretty important. You stamped in the wax, Roman government. Folks, you don't mess with a seal. Nobody can break that seal except Pilate himself. If, a Roman, if anybody broke the seal, they would be, according to one source, they would be crucified upside down. That was the penalty for breaking a seal. And so you got the guard and you got the seal all put there by the Roman government. And and to which I would say, the resurrection of Christ is no hoax because there's no way anybody could get into that tomb to get the body out. You follow me? Hey, here's here's your first reason for the resurrection. The tomb was guarded and the tomb was sealed. There's no way the disciples were going to get in that tomb. There's no way anybody, Roman soldiers, anybody was going to get into that tomb. Um, This this gives certainty to the resurrection. Um, Here's the irony. The very thing, the very thing the chief priests and Pharisees are concerned about that the disciples wouldn't come steal the body. Christ's en- enemies make it impossible for them to do it, as I just said, but it in turn proves the resurrection. See, they're trying to keep it from happening, but their actions prove it happened because they got it guarded so well. They got it protected so well that nobody 
nobody could get into that tomb. By the providence of God, these men give us that reason for believing the resurrection. I will say this, I will say this, after the resurrection, down in verses 11 through 15 of Matthew 28, after the resurrection, the Pharisees do pay the religious, do pay these guards to spread the lie that the disciples stole the body. Uh, we see that in 11 through 15, but I don't have time this morning to explore that with you. But the point is, number one, the resurrection is not a hoax because the tomb was guarded and sealed. You see another reason here in chapter 28 um, the stone was rolled away. A huge stone in front of a tomb. In verse 1 of Matthew 28, it says this, Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn the first day of the week, that would be Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. Uh, it was early in the morning, Dawn, about to break, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. If you read the other gospel accounts, there was also probably three other women there. Um, it wasn't just those two. Uh, flip over to Mark 16 just for a moment. you see why these women come to this tomb early in the morning. Verse 1 of Mark 16 when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome, these th three women are mentioned here, bought spices. So they waited until the stores open possibly and got some spices together to bring them to the tomb so they could anoint the body of Jesus. They loved him and they wanted to anoint his body. Even though Joseph of Arimathea, whose tomb this was, who owned this tomb, he had done that with, we're told, another place with 75 to 100 pounds of spices already. But they want to anoint the body. Um, un, but in their zeal, they forget something very important. Look at verse 3 of Mark 16. Who's going to roll away the stone for us? I mean, verse 4 tells you it was an extremely large stone. In fact, these stones would cover the entrance to a tomb, and it could take up to 20 men to roll them down. It was a disc shape. Historically, uh, historians tell us it was a disc shape stone, very large. It would take a number of men to roll it down an incline to the face of the tomb. So they realized, wow, we, we forgot about that little detail. Um, but they didn't have to really concern themselves with that too long because go back to Matthew 28, verse 2. Matthew 28, verse 2. And you see, behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. So the stone is rolled away when they get there. This is a second earthquake. I don't know if you recall the crucifixion or not, but there was an earthquake there. There was another earthquake here. God sending an angel, earthquake moving this huge stone out of the way before the ladies arrive. Verses 3 and 4 tell us that the soldiers saw this too. Notice this angel... His appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Uh, in the vernacular, they passed out. Just passed out. Um, they saw the Shekinah glory of God, white as snow. They were frightened and they passed out. The women didn't pass out. Verse 5 and 6, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. 
He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said, come and see the place where he was lying. I know why you're here. I know why you're here. You are here looking for, and I know who you're looking for. You're looking for Jesus. He is not here. Come and see the place where he is lying. He was lying. Um, Keep in mind, nobody ever saw the actual resurrection happen. Nobody saw that. Um, Actually rising from this grave, no one actually saw that. Uh, They saw him afterwards. They saw the evidence of it, but they did not actually, no one actually saw him rise. Um, Point number two here that I make is that a reason that the resurrection was no hoax is because the stone had to be rolled away and the stone was rolled away Um, and the soldiers didn't roll it away as execution upside down on a cross to to break the seal. Um, The disciples didn't roll away. They, They couldn't roll that thing away. Nobody rolled it away, but something more powerful than any man or any women could do. Um, God through an angel rolled it away. The third thing I'd point out to you is the tomb tomb is empty. You saw that, I just read that to you in verse six. But the tomb is empty. This is another reason why the resurrection is not a hoax. And notice how he says it here. He is not here for he has risen just as he said, come see the place where where he was lying. Um, Matthew doesn't tell us if the women went in or not, but Mark does. Go back over to Mark 16, verse 5. Entering the tomb, verse 5 says, the women enter the tomb. They saw a young man sitting at the right wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. Mark says they entered the tomb. The the ladies entered the tomb. Um, Obviously a large enough tomb for the ladies to get in and stand in or whatever. But they saw a man wearing a white robe. This is another angel. Luke and John tell us there were two angels. Matthew and Mark tell us there was uh, one angel. But it doesn't matter. That doesn't mean there's a discrepancy. That just means that gospel writers give us partial information. All of, none of them give us the whole, everything that went on. But, uh, you know, we have partial accounts in all the gospels of these. But this angel says the same thing as the first angel. This is the place where they had laid him. He is not here. He has risen. That's the greatest message ever. Um, Imagine these women, they were witnesses at the crucifixion, and they had seen his death, and they had seen his suffering, and they thought it was all over. They didn't come to this tomb expecting a resurrection. They came expecting to anoint a body, and now they're seeing that he has raised. And the angel gives us one of the greatest theological statements imaginable when he says, he is not here, he is risen The reason God raised Jesus from the dead was not just so we could have an impressive miracle, not just so that we could have a holiday, not just so that we could have something to celebrate every year. No, the reason God raised Jesus was to make the huge statement that says, I am satisfied. I am satisfied with my son's death for the payment of sin. That is what he is saying. I am satisfied. My justice is satisfied in raising Jesus from the dead. That is a tremendous statement. My holy justice is satisfied. I accept his payment for sin totally. Romans 4.25. Listen to this important verse. Romans 4.25. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions. God delivered Christ over because of our sin, our transgressions. 
and he raised him because of our justification. In other words, he was crucified for our sins. He was a sacrifice for our sins. The wages of sin is death, and Christ died in our place. He died for our transgressions. He made a sacrificial death at the cross to satisfy payment to God for sin. And, and because of that, God is able to declare us righteous in his sight. And we don't have to fear dying. We don't have to fear going to hell when we die. Uh, no sin will ever be held against those who trust Christ. And that's what it means, was raised because of our justification. He made us right with himself. He, he delivered him because of our, he delivered him over to be crucified for our transgressions and he raised him up for our justification. In other words, to make us right with himself. The only way you can be right with God is through Christ. The only way you can be acceptable to God is through Christ. Your good works won't make you right with God. Your good intentions won't make you right with God. Going to church will not make you right with God. Only Christ can make you right with God because only Christ paid for your sin. And your sin, your sin separates you from God. And Christ died for your sin and he was raised for your justification. He was raised so that you could be declared righteous before a holy God. Boy, that's a great truth. That's, a, that's, what, that's how the angel's saying. He is risen. He is not here. It doesn't say this in um, Matthew or Mark, but in John's account, it's interesting, after Mary Magdalene goes to tell Peter and John that Jesus has risen from the dead, this is in John chapter 20, it says that Peter and John run to the tomb, and they get there, and they look inside the tomb, um, and they see the grave clothes. Uh, they see the head covering. Um, and, and the point that's made there in that passage is that those grave clothes were just, it, it was neat. It was, it was neat in that room. It wasn't like a, a grave robber had gone there and stolen a body, like you'd had thrown everything out. But everything was just laid in a neat, orderly fashion in John 20. You can read that account. But what's interesting about that is, is that Christ was raised right through those cloths, right through all of those, all that, those linens that were wrapped around him. He was raised right through that. Um, he passed right through those, those grave clothes. So, so it wasn't a grave robber that would have had to go in there and unwrap his body and get all those pounds of spices off of him and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't anything like that. You see, what happened to the body? You know, well, disciples stole it. That was what people said. But you got to think about these disciples. These disciples were scared. These disciples had fled. These disciples were in hiding. These disciples were not expecting a resurrection. And later on, these disciples all die, with the exception of one of them, all die as martyrs for the risen Christ. They all saw Christ, and they went on, and they became, you know, apostles of the church, apostles preaching the gospel, preaching the message of the resurrection of Christ. And you think about that for a minute. Uh, there are people who will... Uh, die for something. There are people who will die for something they think is true, but isn't true. You got me? There are people like Islamic terrorists, for example. They will die for their cause because they believe their cause is true. But we know it's a lie. But the disciples died. To, to say the disciples did that... If they stole the body and they knew it was all a lie, 
it does makes no sense they go out and die for it, does it? Because they knew it wasn't true. They, were, they might tell people it was true, but they themselves know it wasn't true, so they're certainly not going to die for something that they know is not true. They died for it because they knew it was true. I tell you, a view that has been very popular in liberal circles for a long time. Actually, actually, it didn't come about until the 1600s. It's called the swoon theory. The swoon theory. Let me just read you a quote about this one. Um, it says that Christ never really died. He just swooned, meaning he went into shock from the wounds. Uh, he went into sort of a semi-comatose state. He was assumed to be dead, and therefore they took him down from the cross and placed him in the tomb. But when he got in the tomb, this view says, he was revived by all those spices that Joseph of Arimathea put on him, and he awoke in the tomb, and, you know, got out somehow. Um... And the disciples just assumed that he had risen from the dead and they just perpetuated an illusion. Um, like I said, it wasn't invented until 1600s uh, by some man's name, Venturini or something like that. But uh, the Romans, as I said earlier, were very proficient about death. They knew how to kill. Um, he was dead. If it were true it would mean that Jesus successfully survived severe beating, crucifixion, asphyxiation on the cross, a spear thrust into his side, entombment with 75 pounds of spices wrapped around his body, and after three days with no food and no water, woke up without medical help or any human help, having lost most of his blood, moved the stone, walked out, overpowered the Roman guard, and then convinced people he was alive from the dead and perfectly well. And then walked seven miles to Emmaus, on feet torn apart by nails. Well, you get it. Nothing there to get. <laughs> and finally, the fourth thing, I would just say this to you. You see this in verses 20, chapter 28, 7 through 10. The Lord appeared to his disciples. Matthew 28. Matthew 28, 7 through 10. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you so. Keep in mind, they're now in Jerusalem. Uh, angels tell um, these women to go tell his disciples. Verse 8, they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And then while on the way there, Jesus appears to them, and they saw him, and he greets them. And that word greet is an interesting word. It's, it's a casual greeting. It's a greeting of, how's it going? How's it going? You know, greeting, very casual, or uh, hi, or hello type of greeting. But he's in a new resurrected body, and, but they're able to take hold of his feet and worship him. The same Loving, tender-hearted Jesus, they knew before his death, they worship him. Verse 10 says, Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. I will see them in Galilee. So he appears to his disciples. This is the, another reason, another reason for uh, the truth of the resurrection. The resurrection is not a hoax. He appears to his disciples. It's not just an empty tomb. It's they saw him. They saw him. They'll see him later that night in Jerusalem. The, some saw him on the road to Emmaus. Uh, 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 there are several other appearances and then eventually in Galilee. 1 Corinthians 15 is an interesting chapter. If you want to turn there just for a moment, let me just show you. It wasn't just these 12, these 11 that he appeared to. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 8, 
Um, I'm not going to read all those, but Paul writing these words says, I make known to you, brethren, verse 1 of 15, 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel which I preach to you, it's the gospel that saves you, verse 2. See, the reason it's good news is because it saves you, it saves you. It saves you from the wrath of God. That's the good news of the gospel. You deserve the wrath of God. I deserve the wrath of God. But the gospel is good news that I can be saved from my sin and therefore won't have to face the wrath of God. Verse 3 says, For I delivered to you as of first importance, and first important, the most important thing, the gospel, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now. Listen, when Paul writes this, he says, there's some of those 500 that are still alive. Go ask them about it. Some have died. He appeared to James, all the apostles, and last of all, to me, to me, Paul. Some people say it was a hallucination. You know, granted, granted, some people have vivid imaginations, but no two people have the same hallucinations. They don't. Just get them in the room talking about them, and none of them sound the same, right? This is the same hallucination. If it's, an, it's not a hallucination, but that's the accusation many make. 500 plus people saw this post-resurrection appearances went on for 40 days until the ascension in Acts 1. They all thought he was dead. They all had to be persuaded. They're just people like you and I that had to be persuaded they thought it was all over. They thought it had ended. Turn to John 20, and I'll close with this. This is Thomas. John 20, 24. This is Thomas. He wasn't there on the some of the other occurrences where Christ appeared. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus because he was a twin, that's what the word means, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands and the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I, I, you can call him Doubting Thomas if you want, but I just respect that. I mean, he had to be persuaded. He had to know. He had to know. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst. This resurrected body was not confined to walls. He said, peace be with you. And Jesus said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here with your hand, your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. I, I want to tell you something. That verse right there is proof of deity. He's talking to God, the Son. My Lord and my God. You don't talk to a sub-God that way. You talk to God that way. My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, and this is important, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. Therefore, many other signs also performed in the presence of disciples which are not written in this book, but these I have written down. John says, I have written down these things that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. I wasn't there. You weren't there. 
but I have what John and Matthew and Mark and Luke and Paul have written down. I have their words. And Romans 10 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God has given us his word, his spirit, inspired word. Uh, this is the only book he's attached his spirit to these words. And God has given us his word, his truth, that we might have faith that God will use his word to open our eyes to that truth. Um, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's Romans 10. Then he goes on to say, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Listen, I would pray that you will look in the tomb today. I pray that you will look at the evidence today. I pray that you'll look at all those things that are written down in God's word. If you don't know Christ, I pray that those reasons I've cited for you today, straight from God's word, that God would use those to open your eyes and open your heart to the truthfulness, that you might, as John says in John 20, 31, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing you may have life in his name. The resurrection of Christ is God saying, I accept the death, the payment that my son did for your sin, that I might I might be able to declare you as being righteous in my sight because I will not have sin in my sight. And folks, if I don't have Jesus, all I got is myself, and that's just sin in his sight. But Christ is the one that takes away my sin. When God looks at me and looks at you as a Christian, he does not see my sin. He sees Christ. He sees forgiveness. He sees the righteousness of Christ. I need Christ's righteousness, not my own in order to stand before God. And Christ makes that possible. Well, I invite you to that. If, hey, listen, if you still got questions, explore Christianity. Come explore Christianity with us. Come ask those questions. Um, we'd love to dialogue further with you if you'd like to know. But that's, once again, I remind you, Wednesday, April 6th. Um, it's non-threatening, no questions, a bad question. Hey, you come. You just come to it. It's an hour and a half. We'll feed you and give you a chance to ask your questions. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for Resurrection Sunday. Thank you that every Sunday is a reminder to us that you are alive, that you are not there. You're not in that tomb. All the evidence is there, God, that the disciples could have never stole the body, that the little women could have never rolled the stone away. Father, that... Um, God, your appearance to the disciples, all of the evidence, Lord, that just point to your resurrection. We praise you for providing those truths to us in the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen.